Let's give away the game at the start. It's the journey that matters, not the destination. Most of the things we'll do in life, we will ultimately fail at. From businesses to marriages to plain and simple passions, there's no way for any one person to succeed at everything, so we pick up the pieces and take what we learn from one experience into the next. I utterly failed at making gaming videos eight years ago, but that got me comfortable enough recording myself to make Yu-Gi-Oh videos that did a little bit better, which got me up to speed on editing to make anime videos later, which gave me the narrative background to produce what I do now rather than just taking online quizzes. Not to say it's not real content, just that, well, I, I kind of sucked at it, and failing at it was best for me to find something I'm actually good at here. If I succeeded there, I don't think I'd be nearly as fulfilled as I am with this current style. Every single step along the way, some of the skills I learned transferred over to make the next attempt better and broaden my horizons to what really mattered. I don't need to get better at games anymore, but I did need to get comfortable with a microphone, and I don't need to know every Yu-Gi-Oh card anymore, but I did need to understand how to record footage and edit. Don't get me wrong though, I still do know every Yu-Gi-Oh card pre-2018. I just don't need to anymore. But that's why the journey matters, because as long as I'm concerned with seeking something, I won't get caught up on the fact that, well, around seven years of my life, I was basically floundering to start this channel on the path to what I wanted in life. Plenty of stories reach this message, from Sunny Boy to A Place Further Than the Universe to Violet Evergarden to, hell, even Black Lagoon or Cyberpunk Edgerunners. It's a sort of base theme in all of these, expanded upon with a more distinct take. A place further than the universe shows all the hardships of getting to Antarctica for a group of teenage girls, presenting how they come together in the worst moment, and then further how even though they get there, it has to end because without a journey, we stagnate. Violet Evergarden sees a former child soldier learning that there is no one answer to what I love you means, but rather that there are many different ways to experience it, i.e. you can never find it, you can only keep up the search and maintain the version that you find. And even those darker stories without a hopeful twist can embody this, like Black Lagoon, which showcases one man's failure to change a world which wronged him. He began to think that he was the master, that he could control the end, and he couldn't. And that idea of focusing on what can come from it all over anything else almost loses him everything in that anger. And Edge Runners is essentially stating that all you have is the journey, going a bit further than Black Lagoon to have its carriage to succeed, but then ultimately show it was only ever a bastardized success and a lie, and none of it mattered anyway. But something that you start to feel as you analyze as much as I do is that when you've seen all those takes on the idea is, okay, how though? I get that I have to keep journeying no matter what, but don't we all give up eventually compromising with harsh reality to accept some level of, of comfort instead of the chase? You can say to not let that happen over and over and over, but it's just words without method. And maybe the point is that that method is up to us, and it is, but without even some framework, it's like a teacher showing the answer to a math problem with no work. My biggest roadblock in writing recently has been that having covered so many things, each take feels more and more repetitive and shallow because there's only so many things to cover. I want something deeper, so I, I don't just want the reason for why the story happened as it did, I want the reason behind the reason. You can tell me the journey is more important, but how do I make that journey a good one? So, after a week of absolute frustration, I turned to one of the remaining Satoshi Kon films I had to see, Millennium Actress. I've been on a tear of all of his work since, I guess, maybe midway through last year, and it's all been fantastic. But this one is about the journey and not the end, with the plot following the small-scale documentary of Chiyoko Fujiwara's life, a once-famous actress who's been reclusive for many years. She was just about your average girl, born in 1923 and growing up joking about romance with her mother who felt she should get married and take care of her home when she's older, nothing too special. However, a chance encounter with an artist wanted by the oppressive government of the time leads her on a lifelong quest to return his key to him, which he says is, It's the key to opening what is most important. 
since he's forced to flee after she takes care of him and drops it. Unable to find him, she takes the opportunity presented to her to become an actress, hoping that the man who painted her portrait would see her face once more and remember her. But unknown to her, he was killed by the very man who she helped him escape from many years prior, and after dozens of roles and hits, she finally says to herself, I was no longer the same young girl that he would remember anymore and gives up on the chase, retiring to the country alone. She doesn't know he passed, but she does know that the self he would recognize has. She only takes on the documentary now because its director has a gift for her, the key she lost on the day she gave up all those years ago. And on an earthquake-prone day, just like the day she was born and the day she quit, this return leads her to recount how she came to this point. And what we see most of all is that chasing this band she could never find was probably the best thing she could have done, pretty much causing this full life she led, and only when she gave up the chase did that end. This is first shown in the way her journey begins. A local director spots her and wants her to star in a film made in Manchuria to inspire the troops fighting there, since this is during Japan's pre-World War II invasion of China. While Chiyoko shows an interest in at least trying, her mother staunchly refuses, arguing that her way of serving the home is to well, make a home, not a film. Leaving in frustration from this meeting is how she runs into the painter and misdirects his captors, taking him back home to heal, where he expresses what he does and that, although he loves it, his painting doesn't exactly help his friends fighting in Manchuria much. He's forced to flee, she finds the key, and can't chase down his training time, but then the dots connect. If it's filming there and that's where he's going, then this is her chance and she takes it. She agrees to act only to have a chance at being in the place he is. The reason this whole career which became so prolific began is because it put her in the right place at the right time for something entirely different that she desired, and that's it. Without the want to chase after him, none of it would have happened. It immediately stresses the importance of holding such a desire, something of inspiration for oneself because we know that she was facing resistance which frustrated her but that she didn't find worth fighting at first when it was just a goal someone else presented her. It was only once there was something she actually found important enough to sacrifice for that that the journey could begin, understanding her time and energy as worth the chance. But it goes further than this as she fails to find him there but continues to act in order to have the greatest reach possible holding out hope that one day he'll see one of her films, remember her, and keep good on the promise to show her those landscapes he described as a thanks for saving his life. What she wants isn't fame or money or even success, but to see that deeply held desire come true. She's like the anti-actor actor. This means that not only did it give her the motivation to push past what stood in the way of a full life, but it also allowed that life to persist. Given that she retires early when it feels over to her later, we see that although she might like acting in some ways, it's more or less just the means to an end for her, to be visible to one man. It's just a job, even if she is very good at it. The act of chasing what she genuinely desired, not reaching a goal but always searching, is basically what let her do what we all struggle with each and every day, which is facing our harsh realities with ever-shrinking motivation. While many solely give up what they desire for compromise, she continues on with a desire which is long-lasting, essentially because it was unaccomplishable. There was never a point of, okay, I'll rest now, or maybe tomorrow, or I guess this is fine instead, because every chance needed taking and the end was always out of reach. Failure, not success, was what led her life to being more fulfilled than simply being a caretaker for another as she was pressured and expected to be. We see part of this pressure in the original director's nephew who takes his place, Junichi Otaki. Almost from the start, he shows an interest in her, even though he's a lot older, and later in life, he's pretty direct about his feelings, which she almost gives into, but refrains when reminded of her journey from the key. Not taking the basic option that finds her, but holding out for, and actively searching for, what she really desires. This is expanded upon as later when she loses the key is when she does marry him with mixed results. This leads to one of the most powerful moments of the movie, done through its contrast to everything else. 
where before we're jumping through action scenes nonstop from train crashes to samurai duels. Here we get her vacuuming and dusting in the house for 20 seconds with nothing else occurring, greeted only by the soft sounds these actions produce. I don't want to say how anyone should live their life, and what provides you fulfillment, which only you can decide, is what's best for you. But can we really say that this is the most fulfilled her life could be? To go from grand experiences and entertaining others to what she says only occurs after a gaping hole opened to her heart from losing the key, which is this? And even if this is what someone desires, can we ignore experience? How do we know that what we desire isn't simply driven by our inability to yet find something greater? Always pushing is the only way to at least increase that certainty. This is what everyone wanted her to be. This is even what her director wanted her to be, and she only becomes it when her motivation is literally lost. That's what the whole thing is about, is how do we keep our spirits up against the constant flood of compromise? How do we look back and say, I'm happy with all that occurred and not, well, I guess it could have been worse. And her answer to that is chasing something she can't have, always having a bar which is out of reach because then even compromise means something greater. Because really, all she did was take the chances she was given, right? She got lucky that someone literally picked her off the street and said, you're going to be famous, kid, like the cheesiest dream held by so many, a work of fiction sustaining many. It's just that she found something which led to that opportunity being her level of compromise with reality. Those great chances became her trade-offs. After all, she could have ventured off to find him on her own and done terribly and had to come home with nothing from the very start, ensuring that after maybe a month at best of searching for what she wanted, she would be screwed. Or she could do this work at the same time as the search since they happened to line up, and then parlay that into the search itself, maintaining herself through the realistic means she was provided for an unrealistic goal. She set her sights high that a grand life was formed from the give and take of daily life we all experience. It, it's just a shifting of perspective, really. And when it shifts back to reality for periods at a time, her life isn't really any more truthful or expected. As she's cleaning up someone else's mess, with her husband's unorganized books falling over from simply dusting, she finds a box that falls as well, and in it is the key, stolen by her co-star and given to him, because he found out the co-star's lies years ago trying to get one over on Chiyoko and use that against her for this task. He then holds on to it so her motivation dies, and settling for her becomes him not acting. He doesn't even say sorry for this. He just shrugs and says, it's all in the distant past, so why bother with it? He was the compromise of realism, but not only is it an awful deal, but it's also a lie. This outcome is no more real than her finding the painter. It only happened because he stole what was important to her. It's important to look behind the scenes, because only with eyes backstage can you see that reality is often just as much of an act. It might not be a healthy thing to forever chase after something you can never actually have. In fact, it's probably outright not very healthy. But it can lead you to hold out for healthier options as it did with her. And settling for someone who's actively seeking to capture and use you doesn't sound very healthy either. What defended her from that was chasing something unattainable so that she was looking ahead to get better things, not solely defending against the worst one. The key is her evidence of her motivation, we can say. It's a physical thing which proves some part of it enough for her to believe in it. But it could be anything. It could be a contract, a successful date, praise at work, a number that goes up every now and then, or whatever you want it to be. The physicality of it is just for an effective metaphor, so we can literally witness her picking up and losing that motivation and what happens as a result. It's so important because we just need any evidence to push us forward and prevent the worst from happening because that ability to chase is always within us. It just needs maintained. We see this as even 30 years later when Genya returns the key to her, she can leap into all these stories and tell them with just as much power as she did those times before, making Genya cry and hope and hate the villain just as he did when he watched those films and her characters so many times before. What we're seeing is that she never lost the edge. She never lost skill. After all, what made her a good actor to begin with was passion. 
as her first good scenes were meant to be improvised from emotion, and what she drew on was her quest to fulfill that task. Even now, it was still just as passionate within her. The only thing she had lost was the idea that it was worth chasing, the faint glimmer of hope that down the road it could be achieved, even if it was almost a zero chance. Regaining the key brings back that spark of hope and leads to her giving this powerful performance once again, even after many years of giving up and essentially living the life she was told to. She adds her own twist on that life with her garden and the specific flower she loves in it, making tea she's proud of and so on, but this is basically the average life, the compromise she once denied. She disappears into those expectations she once beat when the key is lost. And there's probably happiness in that, being able to do so with your own twist at least. I don't think that's strictly a bad thing. It's just that it isn't the best thing either. It's never actually what she wanted, just what she could be okay with, I guess. And it's being able to experience a bit of the best thing again when she reclaims the key all those years later that she comes to an important realization about it all. The earthquakes plaguing their filming day, as well as her own deteriorating health, land her in the hospital. In fact, it's even worse, it lands her on her deathbed. All she got of that glory after so long was a few good hours. But seeing that it was possible even after many years till, she came to understand what was important about her love all that time. Because after all, what I really love is my pursuit of him. In other words, the journey, not the destination. It doesn't matter if she found him. It didn't matter if she even really came close, because as we said, it was never even possible. He had already passed. What mattered was that he was something to chase, something to make her strive for better, something to prevent her from compromising on herself to meet a world which often raised talent, something to keep her from giving up. Everyone has a moment of failure in them. Everyone has a line somewhere in their mind where they give up for good. Society is built on such a thing, a bastardization of its original design to provide a baseline for all against the worst. All this did was push that line of acceptance further, and it led to great things. And that's all it can do. All it needs to do is push that line. There doesn't need to be success or great things. It just needs to keep us from accepting that ultimate failure. This is all fine and good, and Millennium Actress's take on that common theme is a fantastic one with just those details. A couple of years ago, this would have been the end of the video, but we mentioned how stories often layer something else on this theme, and that's what makes them truly special and what keeps us able to talk about so many of them again and again and again. I'm pretty good proof of that. And of course, this is a case much the same. Where this energy of Khan's work is truly special is that it doesn't just say, aim higher for the journey's sake, but it actually provides some detail for how the characters are able to do so, which of course is expertly intertwined into the very presentation and originality of the movie, because of course it is, this is the guy who wrote and directed Perfect Blue, the literally lives up to its name because it's named Perfect and is Perfect movie. Let's restate a few things. Chiyoko is keeping up her motivation aiming higher than she needs to. We, we could say searching for something she can't actually achieve, something that's almost unreal, you could say it all is. Unreal, something like, something like fiction. From the very start, she's achieving this through crafting herself a story. Let's look back at the moment he says the key is the most important thing. She sees the lock on the art supplies and it's likely that that's all it was. He was just being flowery because artists gonna artist. It's the same reason why this script is 13 pages and not five, because I like to hear myself talk in ways that sound kind of fancy. It's the same way a writer locks their computer or the craftsperson their shop. He locks away what he needs to protect his work and make it sound good. That's pretty simple and pretty real. But he phrased it in such a whimsical way and she rolled with that because she said to him, But please don't tell me. It'll be my homework for tomorrow. This means that even if just intended for a day, she doesn't actually want to know what reality is. She finds more value in the story twisting and turning in her own head. And further, knowing it was almost certainly just a key to his supplies, deep down she knows that he doesn't actually need this key returned to him. 
Even if it was a key to his house or something more important, he wouldn't need it because you just break the lock and get a new one. There is no key which is important enough to chase someone for so many years. But she ignores this. She takes that 1% chance and turns it into a narrative that the key must be returned against all odds because it is not to supplies, it is to the most important thing. Even if the most important thing just happens to be supplies. The story, in this case, where telling one doesn't lead to negative consequences, is much more valuable than what actually is, and so she works with that instead. As we said, this is communicated in the very presentation of the movie. You've noticed by now from the clips I'm using that much like Perfect Blue, Paprika, Paranoia Agent, or any of those, Millennium Actress blurs the lines between fiction and reality, with Chiyoko's memories and the stories she acted in being indistinguishable from each other, bleeding into one another, and even involving the documentary crew who lived through these recountings or stories with her. There's a simple reason for this, much more than just because it was cool, although it is cool, and that is that for Chiyoko, her life basically was one of these stories. To her, the one telling the past, there really isn't that much of a boundary between the two. From her youth, it took the shape of something you'd only see in the movie. A young girl travels across the ocean to track down someone she loves with only one word, Manchuria. There's no way it would happen, it's unrealistic and corny, it's just like the movie she's in because of desire that can't be real. And you know what that makes it? Perfect. Because when you were watching this movie, which you should, it's available for free online, perfectly legally in many places, or if you haven't seen it, if you were watching any other movie you loved with just as unrealistic a premise, did you sit around the whole time poking holes in it and saying this is too stupid or too convenient to be real? Or did you sit back and enjoy the ride, hoping the whole time that the odds would be beaten and cheering when they were? It makes no sense that they would bump into each other again, as her character does in one of the movies, and she wishes to, or that the portrait he made withstands a bombing of her town in her reality, or that she'll ever even find a hint of him again which we never see accomplished in either fiction or reality, but every time something worked out, it felt good, right? Like Genya, we knew it was a story, we'd even seen it before, but we laughed and we cried and we hated the villain and we felt bad for the hero alike. Stories play with our emotions in such a beautiful way. We set aside reality to believe in them for a moment. The suspension of disbelief. We look past contrivance and errors and realism itself to enjoy a good story. Given a whole YouTube empire can spawn from pointing out holes in movies for years and years and years and years, it's pretty clear there are many holes. And yet, stories persist. We will believe a story more than reality. So, if we're looking for something to continue that motivation, to keep the journey alive and always reach for a high bar to do so, what better way than to tell ourselves a story and make this suspension of disbelief work for us? We'll be compromising with reality either way, I want to make that clear. Ignoring reality outright is dangerous, which we see reflected in Khan's last movie, Paprika, which I think makes a perfect pair to this one. And that's why I keep saying that compromise is what's important and not something like dreams are what's important. It's just that, as we said, this moves the bar for compromise up. It makes us willing to seek more before we settle, pushing that natural progression of life, that natural and necessary progression to a different height. A story is simply a great means to extend that because they are unbounded from reality in a special way, making the excuse to keep trying easier because it allows us to ignore a bit more. Chiyoko pushes past the requests of others to give up again and again, from her mother to her co-star, and even her own doubts about this leading her down a path of end the struggle as the old ghost curses her with in one of the films. She has those doubts the ghost expresses as a child, because that's when that movie was made, but never gives in to them until she's an established and respected full-on adult decades later. She does still give up, but much later than she would have without a story. And overall, that one where the man she's chasing dies is just that. One. Only one story of many she was in, and all the others we imagine that it goes to a happy end even if we never truly know, despite all the odds and against all the evidence. It's harder to kill a story than it is to kill a simple dream of just one person. So part of the reason she can keep going for so long is simply because of that. The want to believe isn't just a momentary thing. 
I mean, look at it this way. A relationship with stories will change throughout our lives. And the kinds we enjoy and want to experience will change. But do we ever just give up on them? I used to love fairy tale, but finding it to be awful now doesn't mean I hate stories, just that I found different ones to broaden my horizons, ones more like myself, ones more fulfilling to me. The formula of narrative is tried and true across all times and spaces of ourselves. It offers, however vague, a structure to the dreams placed within them and makes it easier to understand and harder to tear down because they persist. No matter what, when, where, who, why, comment across all people, we all tell stories. So that's a pretty strong basis, if you ask me. Plus, they reaffirm themselves, don't they? It's not just that she was placing herself into stories, but that she was putting herself into the role of a woman who, despite still chasing a man, was expressing feats of her own confidence and her own strength. She was a ninja fighting off tough foes, a princess riding into danger and learning how to fight for what she wanted, even an astronaut choosing to go out on her own into space, no small task for sure. And during all of this, her own setbacks become the enemies of the films. The man with the scar who was chasing down the painter is the common enemy, and her mother's desires for her to give up appear in one as well. I think this is more of how she herself was getting into these stories. After all, how is one in a story if they aren't a character in the story? And how are their problems represented if not in the same way? She's playing the role that conquers those enemies, giving herself a strength and a relation to those who achieve and save the day. It's dramatizing her life events into these do-or-die situations where everything is on the line and the hero has to succeed, motivating her to once again look past that unrealistic nature and seek out greater achievement through it. She's not just facing a person's problems, she's facing grand villains who must be stopped for the sake of all things good. And the hero always wins, don't they? Despite feeling like it would add pressure, if we once again lean into the persistent nature of stories and even tropes, which includes the hero winning most often, then we don't have to worry about that pressure. It's like when you're sitting in a theater a bit nervous and you remind yourself, why am I worried? The heroes are going to win. This danger is just a good challenge for the hero. This downswing is just development to make them greater on the upswing. If all hope seems lost, it's only for a dramatic reveal. There's pressure, but the pressure always alleviates to great effect. A story is an excuse to scoff off the odds. They're just there for dramatic effect anyway. This is why so many of the stories she's in have the same plot points that almost every single one can line up with some part of her situation. They're tropes and ideas that are just common to human experience and dreams. What she's acting out and incorporating into her own being is the beings of others, the hopes and dreams of the people who wrote it, which they themselves found in the stories before them. We kind of love seeing these things happen. We desire them, and so we tell them over and over and over again. Is it really a coincidence that she's basically acting in the same story across all these different ages, settings, and genres? Maybe it sounds unoriginal, but it's showcasing that what she desires truly isn't that out-of-the-box and stupid a chase because it's something so deeply human that we can end up saying it again and again and again and again. It's no accident that no matter what age she is, people loved it just the same too. Whether she was a teenager or an adult woman with an established career and family, whether she was an astronaut or a princess, people loved her and her character in the same role. Her desires aren't really lining up with some magical or mysterious thing. They're lining up with a part of what it means to be human to begin with that we're just often forced to shelve. Think of it like this. The painter speaks of bringing her to see him finish his landscapes in a more peaceful time, since he doesn't really have the ability to slow down or do so during this turmoil. If it was a time of peace, they wouldn't have met the same way, of course. But he could still express what captured her attention no matter when. And if it was peaceful, there wouldn't have been the issues which forced so many people apart and prevented their promise. So what's really unrealistic here? What's really the problem here? The wish to find a special connection and chasing something so important stories across all times and all places and people will tend to it? Or that we kill each other and prevent such things from happening in a kinder world? Behind the scenes, reality is often its own well-constructed act 
just as unrealistic as the things we're told are fiction. I want to take a step back and examine the moment they spoke about the key once more, because it reveals something important about all of this, leading on from how the stories can be so similar and revealing the thoughts of someone with such a deep respect for stories they crafted some of the greatest I've ever witnessed, or at least what I gathered of those thoughts from their expression of them. We've been speaking about stories here in a personal way, telling our own and the person acting in them, but it really is a universal thing, no matter how selfish it might seem, isn't it? There's a whole character in Genya who's literally pulled into someone else's stories as we ourselves are watching and pulled in, so of course there's a broader point here in terms of audience and impact. And it starts with how the painter expresses his craft. He tells her about the settings he works from and what it feels like and costs to capture them, almost freezing for his craft, told in a way that pulls Chiyoko into fiction for the first time that we see. She's in the space he described for a moment, experiencing something she's never experienced before she fades back into reality. That's the real first moment where it starts, where the line blurs, when someone inspires her with their own motivation and their own story. Because what he was doing was communicating to her what's important to him in his own story, the story of a painter who takes the brunt of the cold to capture a beautiful moment. Those landscapes are a place of peace and serenity, untouched by destruction and free from marks except his own footprints, and all too needed to break in the midst of war they're currently experiencing and won't break free of for many years to come. A nation which rejected him and hunted him down, forced his friends to fight and die as even he did. In the same way a director can make a film to motivate troops, he can paint a picture to represent a piece he expresses strong desire for, the hope of a moon that isn't yet waning. These paintings are his own story, his own way of communicating important things to people in a way that it doesn't just say it, but first captures their mind and then says it, forces them to, to look inside, to say it to themselves, and then realize it from the work that you did. We go through all this struggle to present things in creative and engaging ways because of this value, because it allows what may be ignored or boring, what may go untouched and considered unimportant to be brought up and addressed in a universal and entertaining space. It brings it to all these new people and in new places. And not even just that, it does it in a way that inspires them. His motivation inspired Chiyoko, a man speaking on his paintings leading to a full and detailed career of an actor, which itself went on to inspire Genya to become a director and start his own studio, as we see that when he started at her studio, he expressed a love for her work, and then he goes on to name his own after her favorite flower, the lotus. The inspiration is clear. It led to him going on to his own decades-long quest with the key, seeking to bring it back to what he believed was its rightful owner all these years. But then it was the painters that she was seeking to return anyway. She wasn't the owner. In fact, you could probably say that no one was really the owner. Once again, it's just a representation of that mantle being passed down, one character leading to the full life of another because they cared about something, and that care drove them to push past the boundaries of compromise that many never do. Whoever holds that can do much more than they'd ever imagined. It's passed down in a cycle, all different people's take on the story of the key. That's why, getting back to the similarities of the stories, that they exist. Because it's all just a framework to communicate important things to the others who are inspired to live to their fullest by them. Maybe it's just the same story in a different era with a few plot twists, the names are different, and the man with the scar doubts her instead of taking her word. And of course, there is a line where there's no originality being put in, and it's just plagiarism that defeats the whole purpose and shouldn't be respected. We're talking inspiration, not theft. But when done with good intent, all these similarities mean is that someone lived full enough to communicate something which spoke to you so much that you yourself had to do something with it. It means that their work worked. It's inspiration. That's why it can look the same at times. Because creativity, like anything else, doesn't come in massive leaps. It's small steps, small innovations, little remixes on the same ideas until eventually it looks entirely different but came from the same exact base. We even see this as her career progresses. At the start of it, there was no way they could have done a scene with a spaceship with so much detail and charm, so it wasn't done. 
but by the end of it, there could be lasers firing at kaiju and models of spaceships taking off, leading to the same kind of story being told in vastly different ways. And that's amazing because you know what that means? That inspiration can now reach so many more people. All kinds of folks who have never considered seeing some sort of mystical princess production, but would watch the hell out of a sci-fi movie that is basically saying the exact same thing. Everyone has their tastes, which means we can communicate the same thing, or no, not even that we can, but that we have to communicate the same thing in so many different creative and beautiful ways. Eventually, you express that important thing, that important theme and idea, that motivation you're carrying to everyone. We see that, that even Genya's cameraman, Kyoji Ida, who resisted being pulled into the story the whole time, he's the only one who's not acting in it with them, is in a spacesuit at the end for the final story because it pulled him in too. It just took a bit of wearing down and the right phrasing and he fell into it just the same, deeply impacted by someone expressing a life's worth of feelings which will go on to help him consider his own life and what he finds important, making them both even better at their craft to then provide the same thing to the next group after them, passing down the key to the most important thing once more. Does this mean that everyone will become something huge from this, a great director or a famous actress? No. I believe we all hold that potential, but it's only brought out and allowed from some conditions. For example, I work hard every day, but I can only do so because I have the conditions to do so, because I don't have to work two jobs to afford a family or home or food. That's unfortunately how our world works. Exceptional only exists because it has average to compare itself to. The painter dies unknown as she goes on to the fullest extent, and she retires into obscurity as Genya creates his studio. But the thing is, we said the answer to this earlier. Inspiration doesn't have to lead to great things. It only has to prevent us from falling to the worst. It only has to motivate us to see and then take those opportunities which present themselves again and again until enough failures breed success. It just has to keep us from hiding in the woods, believing that we lost the most important thing. All it has to do is this, what you're seeing right here. This moment is my favorite of the entire movie, and maybe even more my favorite of any of Khan's works. It's hilarious and silly, it made me laugh out loud. But it's also so much more. There's another reason why the stories begin to blend with reality as she recounts them, and th this is why. Because they're literally sitting there excitedly miming them out. Two people who, as far as she knows at least, have never met before. But they still do this together. Something so personal and excitable, we spend so much time hiding it. This is the most important part to me because this is what it's all about. It's not about actors and directors or princesses and astronauts. It's about people living full lives in whatever way that is, which just so happens to be those things sometimes. When we communicate our inspiration and excitement, even if it is just to another person in the same room, it still has all the same impact we mentioned with stories. It still makes for memorable moments. It still drives us to care and do new things. It still makes us who we are. This moment is, is ranting in the kitchen at a party about your new special interest. It's finding a fan of your team at the bar and hugging over the story of how your team just won. It's also the team itself playing their hearts out to craft the story they're living. It's seeing that sticker on someone else's laptop and making conversation about the thing you love. It's making a goddamn YouTube channel because you were alone with the things you found important and just wanted to express them to someone, to anyone. The stories are everywhere, in everything, in every moment. We just have to be motivated to listen and create them. We have to be unafraid to act them out with excitement. So lean into your stories. Tell a great one that keeps you going. The only audience that matters is you. The rest is just a really goddamn great bonus. I think it's pretty clear that Millennium Actress fixed the problem I was having at the beginning of this video. This was me presenting what I found in the movie, but it was also a bit of therapy for me. I often write and erase entire scripts thinking, it didn't do enough, it's so obvious and unoriginal. That was why my last week was so awful that I was doubting even my ability to see friends I've known for eight years now. I wrote 20 pages and hated all of it. Was I really saying anything that hadn't already been said by myself or even just understood from a casual watch of the story? What I have to remind myself very often of is the phrase, just say the thing. 
I tend to overcomplicate things, try to add so much new and so many layers that that's why I end up hating what I make because it's trying too hard. It's repeating itself. It's meeting a quota of impactful statements or forcing personal stories and comparing itself to that which doesn't exist. When all it needs to do is put a different spin on things or explain the spin someone else put on things in a flavor that will effectively communicate that to the person who needs it at that moment. Hell, you can even see that in cons works, with most of them presenting an evolution of similar concepts each time. They're alike, but you see how certain elements improve each go, how each take is showing a commitment to his skills and self, but without ever stagnating or without ever trying too much. His works are an expression of the journey itself, where we see him grow in each and every one. And I don't have the words to express the sadness of that journey being ended so quickly. To know that the man who wrote such simply prolific words for a character's death is himself gone too soon. I think deep down when we love stories, we tell ourselves a small one. That one day we could meet the person who made it and let them know how much it meant. And that can never be done for anything he wrote ever again. But that's why this needs to be done. Why we had to keep telling these stories and communicating these ideas. They are what was important to him and so many others before him just the same. They are inspiration and motivation carried on again and again and again through so many people. I don't need to rework the very idea of a video essay each time I make one. You don't have to reinvent the structure of a story each time you make a movie. You don't have to invent a whole new story to live your life. You just need to do whatever keeps it going for as long as it can. To be the most fulfilled as you can. To make the best compromises you can. You just have to say the thing.